It is, it is just wonderful to see every one of you here tonight. I see one of our servicemen here. Uh, amen. Isaac is with us tonight with his family, taking a little break from the Navy. Can we give, can we give Isaac a great big welcome home tonight? God bless you, buddy. Amen. And thank you for your service. Amen. I understand you've been all over the world. Hey, you're going to start singing that old Johnny Cash song. I've been everywhere, man. We thank you, though. Praise God. And we're praying for you and believing God. Hallelujah. So your buddies may not know it, but they're blessed just to be in your unit. Come on. Hallelujah. They may not realize it, but they're blessed to be in his unit because we're praying. And I want you to keep praying for, for him and others in our congregation that are, that are th serving in our armed forces. Praise God. We've, I tell you, we've had an amazing summer and we've been busy, busy, busy. We've been in and out of town. Uh, this morning we got in back in town at what time? I got in bed at 3 a.m. I don't know what time, what time we get back in town. About two o'clock this morning, we drove back in from a meeting last night. And so uh, we, we just had a wonderful time. We've seen God move in some amazing ways. And God has blessed us. This team this year, this extreme discipleship team has been absolutely phenomenal. And uh, they've just blessed Margie and I, and they've blessed people wherever we've been. And we've been privileged to minister to hundreds of people, and we're thankful. And tonight, I'm going to get them to come preach with me. Hallelujah, here at the Lift Church. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, the family should be the, the best audience, and sometimes they're the most challenging audience. So will you just practice your smile real big, just so, so they'll feel encouraged, right? Uh, now, not that, not that grin that makes them think they just did something really stupid. Hallelujah. Because sometimes when we're up here, we, we look at somebody and they grin at us and that grin that just. Boy, you just blew it and you don't even know it. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that makes you second guess things. You got to check your outfit. Hallelujah. You just got to do whatever you got to do. But I'm excited about these young men and young women sharing tonight. And by the, at the end of service, we'll, we will uh, make sure that, that you know exactly who's on, been on the program with us and all of that. But I want to jump right in the word of the Lord tonight. If you've got a Bible, would you open with me to Mark, Mark chapter 5, the fifth chapter of Mark. I'm going to lay a foundation, and then these, these, our team's going to come as the Lord leads them and speaks to them. I'm not going to call on them, but they're going to come and uh, preach with me. And we're just going to see what the Holy Ghost is going to do in this place. Anybody, anybody believe that our generation is desperate for a real genuine move of God? Anybody believe that America is in desperate need of an awakening of, of revival? We talk about that a lot around here. And I pray it never becomes just uh, catchphrases, just cliche terms or words that we use and, and, and yet have lost the, the depth of understanding of. No, in fact, I pray the opposite. I pray that we will continue to grow as a church family into the understanding of what, what it is we're praying for, of revival, of awakening, of a move of God's spirit in the earth in this generation that's going to cause young men and young women and old men and old women and middle-aged men and middle-aged women, come on and boys and girls to turn to the Lord our God. How many believe there needs to be a return to the truths of the Bible? We, we're living in a time when everything, everything's under attack and everything's being questioned. And, and look, it's, it's not bad to, to be asked some questions. Asking questions can, can get you freed up from some tradition of men that has you bound. So that's, that's not a problem. How many understand God's able to deal with honest questions? The problem is when the questions aren't honest. The, thing, the issue is when, when the motive of the questioning is not to get to the truth, but it's to try to distract from the truth. 
Come on. The, the serpent first appears in Genesis asking questions, but his questions weren't determined to get to truth. They were determined to distract from truth and deceive people into believing a lie. And, and so there are many questions in our world today, most of which are motivated with the desire to try to distract from truth. People, people don't like the truth because the truth hurts, but it's the truth that hurts that'll make us free. Come on. Uh, Jamie Buckingham wrote a book years ago. I'll never forget his title. His title was the truth will make you free, but first it will make you miserable. And isn't that so? The truth that frees first makes us miserable. Ah, but if you love the truth, you embrace it even through the process that isn't comfortable and you come to a place of true freedom in Christ. And that's what this generation's longing for. It's what our world's longing for. They just don't know it. They think they know who Jesus is, but too many are like the people in Nazareth. Oh, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the brother of so-and-so? They think they know who Jesus is, but they don't yet really know who he is. But if I could find five people in here at the lift tonight who would graciously, gladly, humbly, thankfully lift your hand and say, I'm so thankful that I know he's more than a man. I know that, hallelujah, he's more than a carpenter. I know that, that he is the great I am, and he died on the cross for my sin. Come on, can somebody, can somebody just give him some praise right now? If you know who Jesus is, hallelujah, lift your voice voice in thanksgiving and give praise. Thank you, Jesus. So in, in Mark chapter 5, we pick up at verse 22. Well, let's just start in verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by the boat to the other side, he's come from Gadara back to Capernaum. A great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. Jairus by name, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. Matthew records this story and says it this way, that this man Jairus came fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him, saying, my daughter lies at the point of death, but if you'll come lay your hand on her, she'll be healed and she'll live. That's important because worship is defined by Matthew, not necessarily as lifting your hands and waving them or clapping or dancing or jumping and singing songs. That's how we think uh, of worship. But he said worship is really an expression of your faith. That if you're believing, you're worshiping. I think I'm going to say that again. That when you believe, it's an act of worship. Therefore, every believer should be free in lifting our hands and clapping and dancing and praising God, not because we're trying to put on a show, not because we're trying to impress anybody, and not because we're trying to convince ourselves, but we should be free because we believe in this God that we're singing to. We believe in the promises that we're rehearsing. Hallelujah. So he, he worshiped him and he begged him and he pleaded with him, oh, come, come to my house and touch my girl. And the Bible said that Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. That word thronged in the, in the original language literally means to the point of suffocation. There are so many people around Jesus that it was a suffocating crowd. Now a certain woman. So Mark is setting the scene for us. In this suffocating crowd with Jesus on his way to Jairus' house. So he's moving in a certain direction with a suffocating throng around him. A certain woman... We don't know her name, but I can't wait to get to heaven and hug her neck. 
because she has blessed me. A certain woman had a flow of blood. The old King James says an issue. She had an issue. I wonder if there's anybody in here that has some issues. She had a flow of blood for 12 years. Can you say that out loud with me? 12 and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus. Now, in the original text, it, in this instance, there is a, a the, an article that is, that is, is supposed and into the text because there were many Yahshua's in first century Israel. There were many that were called Joshua, many that were called Jesus, but she heard about the Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm glad I heard about the Jesus. There are, many, there are many who claim to be God, and there are many gods that people follow in this world, but I'm so thankful that I have heard about the one. When she heard about the Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now, the garment there is a reference to the prayer shawl that he wore. It is a reference specifically that she touched the talit, little, little bitty things that hung off the bottom of the prayer shawl. And each one of them represented the promises of God in the old covenant. So she wasn't just touching a famous person's clothing. She was reaching to touch a holy man and the promises of God that he represented. And she believed if she touched and grabbed hold of that, she would be made whole. Listen to what she said. She touched him for she said, if only. By the way, in the original Greek, the, the verb is in the continual sense. She didn't just say one time. She said and she kept on saying. She said, come on, and she kept on saying. Faith doesn't just say it one time. Faith says it and 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 says it. Hallelujah. Not because faith's trying to talk you into it, but faith's just declaring this is, this is, this is, this is my reality. Hallelujah. She said, and she kept on saying. What did she say? If, I, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, who'd she say this to? She said it primarily to herself. You've got to learn to talk to yourself. You've got to learn to talk faith to yourself. You've got to learn to talk the promises of God to yourself. She's motivating herself. How many think this little woman was tempted to quit, to stop, to give up, to turn back? But she keeps talking to herself. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll not be the same as I am right now. I will be made well. So she touched him, verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, no, notice faith came before feeling. Faith came before feeling. I'm going to say it one more time. Faith comes before feelings. Hallelujah. Some, some of us are waiting till we feel it before we believe it. But if God can find somebody that will believe it even before you feel it. Hallelujah. I'm going to amen myself in a moment. I said, if God can find somebody that will believe it even before you feel it, then he can find somebody that he can work some marvelous things into your life. But when she touched him, when she followed through with that action, she felt in her body she was healed. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power, virtue, dynamis had gone out of him. In other words, this little woman made a withdrawal on the anointing. She made a withdrawal on the power of God in Jesus Christ. And Jesus felt it. He knew immediately that power had been withdrawn. He's a walking powerhouse. A 
and people been bumping into him all afternoon, noon, a great throng suffocating. So people have been bumping. There's been jostling going on in the crowd, but suddenly he stopped because somebody just made a withdrawal. I wonder if on this July 30th at the Lift Church this Wednesday night, I wonder if God can find somebody that'll make a withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on. I, I, I'm going to stop right here for a moment. I think somebody will just release. You need anything from God? Is there been anybody here believing for something from heaven? Then will you just push past how you feel right now? Push past what's going on around you? Lift your voice and say, God, I, I, I'd like to touch you tonight. I'd like to make a withdrawal on the power of who you are, your presence, and your glory. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So he stops and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples, I like to call them sometimes duh, disciples. Because watch this. They get smart alecky with Jesus. You got to be pretty touched in the head to be a smart aleck to Jesus. But all of us have been a smart aleck to Jesus. But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? I just read it the way it's written. And notice Jesus ignored them. He probably gave him a little look. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. I don't know if the writer writing after the fact inserts her or if it's just evident to him that Jesus knew who it was before he looked. But he looked for her. Oh, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now listen, listen, you gotta lay this foundation. Just wanna remind you of some things tonight, but I want you to remember something. You study the New Testament, you'll discover the overwhelming majority of miracles and healings that take place. You see this phrase, your faith, your faith, your faith. Not, not Jesus saying, because I'm God in the flesh, but your faith in me has made you whole. Why is that important in the 21st century? Because even in church, we've got people living a life. Well, if God wants me healed, he'll heal me. Well, if God wants me to do this, he'll make it happen. Well, if God wants me to pass the test, he'll, he'll, make, he'll, he'll, he'll make it happen. Not if you don't study. Oh, I'm going to lose amens right now. Hallelujah. Well, no. Well, and, and you, so people, people just believe that they're sick because God wants them sick. They can't get, oh, if God wanted me to be healed, he'd heal me. But he says, your faith, your faith, come on, your faith. Is there any believers in here tonight? Is there anybody believes that not only can God, but he will do it? He said, lady, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Oh, remember, Jairus is standing there. This lady's talking to Jesus and Jairus is getting anxious. Praise God, woman. Glad you got your healing. Let's go. Give God praise. Now, come on. Jesus talking to her. She's talking to him. And in the meantime, here comes somebody. And they come running up and they, they get Jairus' attention. And they, they say, don't trouble Jesus anymore. Your daughter is dead. Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. Somebody lift your hand. Hallelujah. Come on. Will you wave with me? Oh, glory, glory, glory. I like the, the Weiss translation renders it this way. Stop fearing and only be believing. I'm going to say it again. S Jesus looked at Jairus and said, stop fearing and only be believing. 
and Jairus does it. If Jairus can do it, somebody here ought to grab hold and say, then I can do that too. Stop fearing, only be believing. He permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Notice he gets a little exclusionary here. And Jesus never ever apologizes to the other nine disciples that he took three among the twelve to places he never took them. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Mm -mm -mm. I want to declare over a generation. I want to declare over our children and our grandchildren. I want to declare over young men and young women in the 21st century that they are not dead. They are just asleep. I want to declare that though there's a generation that thinks that, that this generation is dead to God, dead to truth, dead to a revival, dead to an awakening, I, I declare in the name of Jesus, they are not dead. They have just been sleeping. But there is a resurrection that's about to take place in our world. Somebody shout hallelujah. The child is not dead but sleeping. Come on, I think you ought to say it with me. Can you think of some young people? Think of some young man, some young woman you've seen, maybe in a store, maybe in Walmart, maybe walking the street. You can tell by the vacancy in their eyes, or you can tell by the anger of the expression they constantly have. You can tell by the, by the, the look upon their face of depression. Suicide is increasingly becoming an issue with this younger generation. But can you think of somebody, see some of those beautiful young men and young women that are so hopeless and in bondage and would you lift your voice and say with me and with Jesus, they are not dead. They are just asleep. Come on, can you declare it? They are not dead. They are. Oh, hallelujah. I said they are not dead, but just sleeping. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My yelling right now may not make any sense to you, but I believe we're speaking beyond the confines of this room and even beyond the confines of the internet, and we're declaring something in the spiritual world, in the spiritual realm, that God has some people that believe. Hallelujah. That there's a generation about to wake up. I said there's a generation about to come awake. To the glory of God, to the goodness of Jesus, to the power of the cross. The child is not dead but sleep. But watch this. This will happen to you if you really dare to believe this with me. They ridiculed Jesus. They laughed him to scorn. Ha <laughs> ha, they said, you're an idiot. We know dead when we see dead. And she's dead. But he put them all out. Please hear me. That word, Margie looked it up. The, the phrase in the Greek text isn't a polite put out. It's not a, would you all mind please to leave? No, it's a get out. He put them out. You say, well, that's, that's rude. Come on. You're not going to get your miracle. You're not going to get your breakthrough. If you try to always please everybody around you, those that say you try to hang out with those who don't believe and those who refuse to believe and those who scorn and those who laugh and those who chide, you're not going to walk in the glory of God. But if you find, if you come to a place where you need a miracle more than you need their, their approval, you need, you need God in your world more than and you need their smile. I feel like preaching right now. Come on. Can God find somebody here that will say, I I'm getting a little bit desperate. I need, I need him more than I need all these things. Sometimes there has to be a little separation. You got to put some people outside the room or the, listen, even though it's Jesus, if he doesn't get them out, she's not going to get up. I said, if she doesn't get, if he doesn't get them out, she's not getting up. Why? Because they're contaminating the atmosphere. 
He said, I'm going to keep believers in here with me. Hallelujah. And so he puts them outside. He took just the father, the mother, and those that were with him, Peter, James, and John, went into where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. The word arise could be translated awake. Little girl, I say to you, awake. Immediately the girl arose. Immediately. The girl arose. I'm going to say it again. Immediately the girl arose. Little girl, I say to you, the, the literal Greek would be, little girl, I say to you, be arising. Be awaking. Hallelujah. And immediately she rose and walked, for she was, somebody read it aloud. She was what? She was 12 years of age. They were overcome with great amazement. I had you read aloud 12 years for the little woman with the issue and 12 years of age for this little girl. I had you read that for a reason. I don't believe it's the devil that's in the details. I believe God's in the details. I said, I believe God's in the details. And I don't believe it's any coincidence that this little girl is the same age as the number of years this old woman has had an issue. I believe there's a connection spiritually. And I believe there's a message in here for us. And these young men and women are going to come and preach with me about this for these next few moments. And then we're going to pray. And I believe God's setting us up for something at the Lift Church. Anybody say yes, Lord? Come on. How many believe Sevier County is, is getting ready for a revival? They may not know it. They may not see it yet. But hallelujah, I believe it's going to happen. So when this little girl was born, this older woman got sick. When the little girl cried her first cry, the older woman might have grabbed at herself. Could have been the same day. Grimaced in pain and realized she's losing blood. You see, the woman in the Bible is oftentimes a representative of the church. The church is often referred to in the feminine sense as a she, as a lady. And so I believe these two women, one old, one young, one generation and a next generation, I believe they represent the church. And when one generation is birthed, the church generation that is develops an issue. Twelve, twelve is significant because in the Bible, twelve is the number for government. And if you remember, the church in the Old Testament had twelve patriarchs. The church in the New Testament has twelve apostles. And in the book of Revelation, the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles are seen in the heavenly throne room as seated, 24 elders seated upon 24 thrones. And so these two women here, we rejoice in just the stories of their miracles, but I believe there's a prophetic significance to it. And I believe it's going to be played out in our generation. I believe that that older woman represents a generation of church people such as you and I here tonight. And we'd walked with God and we've known the power of God and the glory of God. But somewhere the church got sick. Somewhere some issues developed. I'm not going to get many amens right now, but hallelujah. These other ones going to come make you happy in a moment. But somewhere, somewhere, there was a loss of blood. A lo what, what does that mean? That means she, she had lost power. She had lost vitality. She had lost strength. Listen, you may not like it, but the church in America even, though we have larger numbers than ever in history attending church, the church does not have the influence tonight that the church had 50 years ago in the USA. The church has lost influence in our society. 
society. The church, listen, preachers have lost influence in society and where, and where clergy used to be, uh, it used to be an office that was held in high value and high esteem. Now, if you, if you look at the polls, uh, we preachers are about down near the, the very bottom of the totem pole when it comes to uh, respect and when it comes to trustworthiness. I'm losing amens. But, but something's happened in the church and we keep trying to pretend like everything's great and everything's even better than it ever has been. Meanwhile, what's happened? The church has grown weak and we tried, like this little woman, we tried to find every doctor, every specialist we can, every, every program, everything we can try to, come on, hallelujah. Can I talk to you like your church leaders for a moment? We've tried to find every special thing we can find to try to take care of the issue, but nothing's worked. Millions of dollars have been poured in to trying to be relevant in our society. And while we're drawing big crowds, how many know it's not enough to draw a big crowd? We need the power of God that changes lives. Hallelujah. But there came a point in this lady's life where she, she realized, I put all my money, all my effort, all of my energy in, in the wrong place. But she heard about Jesus. I believe, I believe there's a generation in the church that's turning back to Jesus. I believe there's... Uh, I believe there's some men and women that we're tired of programs and we're tired of smoke and lights and we're tired of all of these other things. We're not against it. We're just, we're just tired of acting like that's the answer. It's not the answer. The answer tonight is the same as it's ever been and his name is Jesus. So she turned back around. She made up her mind. I'm going to touch him again. Come on. I wish somebody lift up your hand and say, if God can just find some people right here at the Lift Church that'll just say, Lord, if we do anything, we want to touch. We want to touch you. We want, hallelujah. You don't have to call our name. We're calling on your name. You don't have to lay your hand on us. We'll, we'll reach out and touch you. And I think it's significant, and I'm going to throw this open for these, these young men and women to come and preach. I think it's significant that the very day the little girl on the next generation in church, the very day she dies, is the very day the older woman touches Jesus and gets healed. I think God's into details. And I'm, I'm all, you may have to chew on this for a while, but I just believe that that little girl's raised, being raised from the dead was waiting on that older woman getting her miracle from God. I believe there's a generation of young men and young women. God's got plans for them. They're going, they're going to see the glory of God and walk in the power of God. But I believe they're waiting. They're sleeping until God can get a, 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 his, his army, his church, until he can get all of us adults in here to turn away from everything else we've been trying to make right and make happen and, and fill in the gaps and just get back to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there's some keys to awakening. The first key, I think, is desperation. Both Jairus and this woman, they, they, they demonstrate desperation. How many believe if we just, if, as long as we can tolerate it, we'll have to tolerate it? I'm going to say it again. I said as long as we can tolerate it, we have to tolerate it. But I wonder if there's anybody in here that's just, you feel something inside you. You just, you just, hallelujah. You don't, you, you, you're just getting tired of, of everything as usual and normal. There, there's a desperation growing on the inside of you. That, I believe, is the first key to awaken. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Come on. Yes, yes. So the first case we see is Jairus. He fell at Jesus' feet. He begged him earnestly. Earnestly means intensely. He took it seriously. See, Jairus was a man of authority. So that means he had to humble himself and weep at Jesus' feet. That is the first thing we see in this passage of desperation. Then the second thing we see is the woman with the issue of blood. See, she battled this issue for 12 years. Could you imagine battling something? We battle things, you know, but I've never battled something for 12 years. So you have to think of the mindset that she had, the discouragement that she had. And she had visited many physicians, and she had suffered many things from those physicians. So, so the embarrassment, 
that she now has suffered. So she is now an outcast. And not only that, but she was weak. So she has all these mind battles and physical battles that she's going through as she's, as she's pushing through the crowd. I just need to get to Jesus, speaking her promise. She's just pushing through the crowd to get to him, to get to that promise. No doubt this was inconvenient for her because when you are desperate, it is inconvenient. Let's be real. It's time that we push past convenience and get desperate once again. Quit pressing the snooze on the alarm when it's time to get up and seek the word and, and make sure that the word is first priority and final authority in our lives. It's time we get desperate again, get foolish. I had a professor once say that you cannot get to the finish line without looking a little foolish. It's time we get desperate and foolish for the things of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, I like it. Somebody. Hallelujah. So it took Jairus and for the woman with the issue of blood, they had to have an act of humility. That's where they take God more seriously than they take themselves. So when Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at Jesus' feet. That was an act of humility. You have to start taking God more seriously than we're taking ourselves. We have to be bold. We have to be humble. So we need to, this generation needs an act of humility to take place where we're starting to take God more seriously than we're taking ourselves and we're taking our thoughts. And we shouldn't care what our friends are thinking around us. We just need to be humble. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on. That's good. A couple of weeks ago, um, the Lord started sharing something with me out of Isaiah. And um, if you want to turn there with me, you can. But it's, it's in verse 20. Um, this came out of a prophetic word that I received. And just God started growing this revelation in me that uh, uh, God's speaking to Israel here. And he says uh, that the, there shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped from the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the, one, on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. God started speaking to me about strongholds and yokes. And uh, there's things that we go through sometimes that uh, we go through seasons of warfare and we go through seasons of just carrying some things that uh, there are things that pile up on our shoulders after uh, months of just, just going through life. How many knows what I'm talking about? With just you, just going through work, you got you got stress with family, you got stress with relationships, with money, with all these things that we we have to deal with. But it, uh, after such after seasons of time, these things can begin to pile up and become yokes that rest on our shoulders. And and sometimes when we when we deal with things for long enough, it begins to become less and less noticeable. And, and uh, there are people that I've seen in my own life that, that uh, because they've been walking under such a yoke, and, and what is a yoke? A yoke is a way of thinking. A yoke is a mentality. A yoke is a way of teaching, uh, a, a, a pattern of teaching that you have begun to believe. And when you carry things for long enough, you begin to believe things about yourself. You begin to believe things about other people that just are not true. And, and when the Lord, you see in verse 20, he, the Lord said, never again, Will you depend on the one that defeated you? Now, why would you be depending on the things that defeat you? Because when you carry yokes and the Lord begins to lift that thing off of you and he begins to open up an opportunity for you to receive freedom, you see, we don't understand what we really want. We just know, we just want the things that we know. We just want the things that we're used to, but, but God is wanting to offer us freedom. He wants to, he wants to destroy the yokes. He wants to, when his anointing comes, his, he wants to destroy the burdens that we, we so many times choose to walk under, but we have to be willing to take, to exchange the yoke that we've been carrying for the yoke of the teaching and the revelation of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, whoever labors and is heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest and, and hear my word, take my teaching, take my yoke upon you and I will give you rest for your souls. There is a yoke, there is a weight of God's presence and, and his teaching that he's wanting to walk on, he's wanting us to walk under, but we have to be willing to let go of the things that we have been carrying so that we can carry a measure of the depth of what God wants us to walk under. Hallelujah. Come on, that's awesome. And he segued into the second key. Number one, we got to be desperate. Number two, you got to be willing. 
You see, some people get desperate. Oh, I'd like to be changed. Oh, I wish things would be different. But they never get willing to humble themselves. Caitlin actually took us there to humble themselves. And then, hallelujah, to let go, let go, let go. Come on, how many are ready to say, I don't want to depend on he who defeated me. Would you lift your hand and say, I want to walk in freedom. Hallelujah. I love this. Some, one of the points I love in this story that can be easily overlooked, Pastor Keith's talked a lot about, whenever this lady dares to go after Jesus, she's not just taking a risk, she's breaking the law. Whenever she steps out, she has to make up her mind. I wonder who in here, your breakthrough is on the other side of you breaking the rules. Because the rules say, the law say, you can't get around people. But your breakthrough says, you better. The rules say, don't you get undignified during worship, but your breakthrough says you better. The rules say you better stand there and act all cute because you don't want anyone knowing your story, but your breakthrough says you need to lay your guard down, lay your image down, quit trying to act like you have it all together. Come to him with your issues and say, I'm willing to break the rules. Why, why, why isn't she supposed to do that? Because she's declared because of her issue, her issue says she's unclean. You've heard that whisper, I'm sure. I've heard that whisper. I've got issues, and the enemy says, you can't do that. You're unclean. You're unclean. But she, she realized something about this Jesus, man. Because you see, in the law, with her being unclean, the law says you being unclean, if you touch someone, your uncleanness gets on them. It defiles them. Because you're unclean, if you touch them, what you have is like cooties. You remember gray school? You touch them, you might catch it. But Jesus introduced us to something better than grade school cooties because in the Old Testament, if you're unclean and you touch someone, they become defiled. But in the New Testament, come on, someone, if you go and you touch Jesus who is clean, what you have doesn't get off on him. What he has, it gets off on you. Why isn't the church breaking the rules saying, I'm tired of playing by the rules. I'm tired of being politically correct. If we're going to win, a generation we've got to break the rules come on lift up a shout hallelujah come on give the lord a praise i love that hallelujah come on come on yeah hallelujah um isaiah chapter 60 it's one of my favorite passages in isaiah it says arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the lord is risen upon you for behold darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord, but the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your lot, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together and come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. I don't know about you, but I've looked around. I've seen the headlines. Darkness has already covered the earth. Darkness has come upon this earth, but God says that he will arise over you. But here's the thing. In order for his light to shine on you, it says that you have to arise. You have to wake up, shake yourself from the sleep, and wake up. As Kaylin already said, quit hitting that snooze button. You know, in, in the mornings, I have to set about five or six alarms because it takes me a little while to get out of bed. But the church has got to stop hitting that snooze button and wake up. Up. Pastor Keith was leading in leadership the other day and something convicted me so much. He said, has your love grown cold? And we talk about, we talk about, we want abortion to end. We want to see the homosexuality community uh, freed from that sin. We want to see God do amazing things. We want to see people set free and delivered. But are we willing to wake up, see the problem and go into their world and shine the light? Are we willing to go to that abortion clinic and stand in front of it and pray and see God move? Are we willing to go to the homeless shelters and minister to people, seeing them set free? The church has got to rise up. We pray. That is so important that we pray for these people, that we pray for the lost. But he's called us to arise and go into darkness so that his light can shine on us. Oh, glory. Praise God. Praise God. Only awakened people can awaken people. Let me, the church in China right now, uh, Christianity is illegal. Uh, 
So a leadership session in China would look like they would tell you that when you are captured, they would teach you how to witness to the jailer on your way to be executed. What is the church in America doing right now? We've got preachers that think it's okay to cuss behind a pulpit. We've got people that think it's okay to drink and to smoke, and they're, they're still right with God. But God is looking for a people that will rise to the standard of being holy. The Bible says to be holy, for I am holy. And God is looking for a remnant. The Bible says if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayer and heal their land. He's not looking for the majority. He's looking for the remnant. So if we would just turn from our wicked ways and pray, he would heal our land. Father, heal our land. Have mercy on America. We've got to see an awakening. We have got to see an awakening. But if we don't get it in our Bibles, we're not going to see it. It is the truth that sets us free. I love encounters. I'll be the first person in line at a fire tunnel, and I'll go through the fire tunnel twice. But it is the word that changes us. It's the word that transforms us. The Bible says that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, taking every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I'm sorry, I don't mean to yell at you. I just get so excited. <laughs> That's not my heart. God's, God's been so good to me. Oh, I tell you what, I say this every time I grab a microphone, but I'm just so thankful for the cross. I'm so thankful for what Jesus did for me. Come on, while I was still a sinner, Come on, while I was still in drug addiction, while I was still bound, Jesus went to the cross for me. And he didn't look at me and see that, you know, one day I would hold a microphone and preach the gospel. No, he seen me in my drug addiction, and that's the me that he went to the cross for. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I'm just so thankful what he's done. He's made a way to reconcile us to God so that we could have a relationship with him, that we could become sons and daughters. And with that sonship comes authority. But we need to walk in that authority. We need to know who we are. We've got to learn this Bible. We've got to learn it forwards. We've got to learn it backwards. We need to get a prayer closet, and we need to pray, and we need to pray. And we don't need to just fast in January. And that, that is convicting to me. <laughs> Can I, can I tell you guys something? I have never successfully completed a Daniel fast at this church. <laughs> I always break, I think last year I broke down and went to cookout with my wife. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, uh, but the Bible says, <laughs> That his grace is sufficient for every area of our lives. And his strength is made perfect in our weakness. I'm so thankful. <laughs> You're going to need grace in a little while. <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. Desperation. Got to get desperate. No longer tolerate what is. Got to be willing to lay our pride by our side. Willing to humble ourselves. We got to speak what God says. That's a key to awakening. You got to say what God says. That means two things. It means we call sin what God calls it. We call issues what God calls If it's sin, we say that. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. The word there mean, confess means to say the same thing as another. So it means that I say about it what God says about it. You see, we keep excusing it. We keep covering it up. Therefore, we keep doing it. 
We stay bound by it. Because he said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean? It means he'll deal with the symptoms and he'll cleanse the disease. But we've got we've to say about it what God says about it. But then we got to say, as Jonathan just did so beautifully, we got to say what God says about us once we're forgiven. Hallelujah. He died for me while I was in my sin. But come on, somebody lift up your hand and say, I believe he forgave me when I confessed it. So somebody raise your hand high and say, I am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on, will you say it out loud? I am chosen. I am elected, ordained by God. Hallelujah. Praise God. But then it's not just enough to talk it and confess it. Somebody lift your hand and say, uh, we got to do it. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Not just a willingness to do it, but somebody lift your hand and say, if you're willing and obedient. Isaiah 119. If you're willing and obedient. If you're willing and obedient. If you're obedient and willing, you will eat the good of the land. And then there's, there's a final point. I'm going to throw this microphone back open. We're almost finished. But there's a final thing. There's a final key. You got to stick with Jesus. You got to stick with Jesus. You've got to stick with Jesus. See, when that woman touched Jesus, she immediately saw a miracle. But Jairus standing there during her miracle, it looked like his miracle was gone forever. And he got the word that the girl, his daughter, his only girl, his 12-year-old daughter, come on, daddies, can you imagine what he felt like? Can you imagine what gripped his heart? Can you imagine the fear that paralyzed him? He got that word. But Jesus looked at him and said, uh, stop fearing. Stop fearing. Be only believing. Be only believing. And Jairus made made a decision right then. He didn't run off. He didn't say sorry. He stuck right with him. Hallelujah. Come on. You got to stick with Jesus. Go ahead. I love this story of Jairus because he stuck with Jesus. When he, when he went and called out to Jesus, he asked Jesus, Jesus, come heal my daughter. Jesus, I believe you. He fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him. He believed him so much. He made a declaration of faith in that moment. And in that moment, things came to test that declaration of faith. There were things that came to test what he had already declared. There were things that came to test what he had already spoken, that he knew that Jesus could heal his daughter, that he knew that Jesus was the healer. He declared it, but then there were things that came and they tested it. The people came to him. He had to wait in line. He was the first one to Jesus. And Jesus had already committed to go with him. So he was walking with Jesus, and here comes this woman, and now he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's watching, and it says that she told all. So we stood there patiently waiting, waiting. And then finally, some of the friends from the synagogue that he's a ruler in, they came to him, and they said, Jesus, don't bother, or I mean, Jairus, do not bother Jesus. Don't bother him. Your daughter, she's dead. She's dead, so just move on. We're just going to come back. We'll mourn with you. This is probably what they were saying to him. Come back. We'll mourn with you. We'll be there for you. Yeah. And that, that was testing the word that he had already declared. Yeah. That was testing. But Jesus looked at him and he said, do not be afraid. Yeah. Do not be afraid. Jairus made a decision to honor what Jesus had spoken, that Jesus had already committed to come with him. Yeah. Jairus honored the words that Jesus said. He chose not to be moved by the words that these other people were saying. And he honored him so much that he allowed Jesus to put the very people he went to the synagogue with out of the room. He honored Jesus so much that Jesus, Jesus shows up in the picture and he's allowing him to push his friends, the people that he did, that he went to the synagogue with every day, those people that he was over or even friends with. He allowed Jesus, he trusted him so much and in that moment, he got the healing for his daughter because he honored, he honored God more than he honored the men around him. He placed weight upon what Jesus had spoken to him.
more than the weight of what other people say. I wonder, I wonder if we placed weight on what God had spoken to us compared to the weight that we place on what everybody else says. I wonder what God could do in this generation. I wonder what he could do if we would place weight on what he is speaking over this world. I wonder the awakening that could come if we would just believe him. And if we would honor him and be obedient, he was obedient. He still came with Jesus. He still went with him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ah, that's awesome. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Jairus stuck with Jesus. He, he determined in his heart that he was going to stick with what Jesus said. He believed what he said, that he, she, his daughter will be healed. And, you know, sticking with Jesus, it's, it's hard to do sometimes when you are praying and praying and praying and you don't see that prayer being answered, it's easy to get to get down and not believe. But you have to stick with Jesus. You have to stay in your faith. When you don't see that prayer being answered, keep on praying, pray harder. If you don't see your healing coming right then, keep praying and declaring your faith and declaring that you are healed. If you don't see that financial prosperity coming right then, stick with Jesus. He wants you to prosper just as your soul prospers. Stick with him, stick in church. When you don't see yourself being raised up in church, when you don't see yourself getting in a leadership position the first year, to that you're there stick with it he will raise you up in due time stick with it stick with Jesus stick with church stick with your leaders and stick with your faith amen that's beautiful praise God got something hallelujah so there's another part of that it's not enough just to stick with what you believe stick with what he's told you you have to stick in church you have to get grounded you have to get planted I know probably more than all y'all how hard it is to get here every single service. I wake up at five in the morning. I teach all day. I don't leave school till 5 p.m., but I'm still here. I did that today. And I have learned and seen these past three years that I've been here now, the amazingness that comes as you stick. Your faith grows when you're in a community of believers. Your faith grows and grows and you can feel such presence here. I can feel the presence here among all of you more than I can anywhere else. The sweet, sweet presence. I realized when we were traveling how beautiful we have it here, how great we have it here. So don't just come when you can. Come every single Wednesday, come every single Sunday, plant yourself in and get rooted and rooted deep. Come on, come on, give a hand clap of thanksgiving to the Lord for all of them, for all of them, for all. Wow, 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 wow. You know what I love is they each one come, you see the uniqueness of the expression, and that's beautiful. We don't want cookie cutter. Come on. I believe what God's called for this place is, is that unique expression. Hallelujah. And how many, how many see the, the message? You hear it. God wants to awaken us. As a generation, look, I, we're just preaching my heartbeat, Margie's heartbeat. It's a generation that God's calling. I call them the Josiah generation. And they're going to be awakened. They're going to rise up. And they're going to experience the glory of God. I believe greater than any generation has ever experienced the glory of God. But I believe they're waiting on us. They're waiting on the church. Jonathan said it, not the majority. God will begin with a remnant. God will begin with the remnant. But listen, the remnant are not those who are just the ones who, who out of everybody else are finally going to make it. The remnant are those God's called to be pioneers. The remnant are those God's called to, to blaze the trail, to fight the fight, to be the, if you will, to be the tip of the spear where many, many others will follow.
but somebody lift your hand if you will if you dare to say, I, I'd like to be in the beginning. I'd like to be in, the, in, in, in that, even though it's challenging, even though it's difficult, even though there's going to be some, some resistance against what we're doing. Come on, how many? In fact, I dare somebody who would just, just stand and say, God, if you've if you got one person in here that's going to touch you like that little lady, then let it be me. Let it be me. Let me be. Let me be the one, Lord, who's just going to touch you. Come on. Can you just lift your hands all over this house? We're about to leave here in a moment. But I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken to us tonight. We made some declaration of some things. God, let, the, let us be a desperate people. God, let, a, let us be a people that are willing, Lord. Yes. One of the biggest concerns is that we're inviting the, the world to be hungry for a God that the church appears to no longer be hungry for. It's one thing to stick with God in a culture where we're inviting him to stick with us. The whole time we're saying, well, he invites us to follow him, but we're saying, Lord, will you just follow me in my sin and my complacency and my compromise? God, will you stick with me? At the end of this story, one of my favorite points, Pastor Keith's preached so many times, the little girl, as soon as she gets up, life comes back into her body. Jesus says, now give her something to eat. Hunger is a sign of life. And if it's true that hunger is a sign of life, then the opposite must also be true. No appetite is a sign of death. As a little five-year-old boy, I had some weird stuff start going on in my body, and I, I went to my mom and dad, and they noticed, they noticed he, you know, he's, he's acting lethargic. He's got all this weird stuff going on. They knew something was wrong. They ended up taking me to the doctor, and they ran all these tests, and at five they said, it looks like your son has leukemia. And we need to take him to a specialist and go ahead and start getting some tests done and get all get him on the path to recovery. Well, they made a mistake because they scheduled two weeks in between that appointment and whenever they're going to start running the test. And my parents got a hold of the horns of the altar with the church. And that stuff wasn't in my body the next time they ran tests. God completely healed me. Come on. Over 20 years later and not a trace of it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. They took me to the doctor, not when I complained the first time about this symptom or that symptom. They took me to the doctor when they realized they'd make dinner and they'd sit it in front of me. And time after time, I wasn't hungry. Why? Because if you're not hungry, there's something wrong. And in this room, even tonight, I, just, I sense even in a, in a culture like the lift, a revival culture where we're passionate for the Lord, I want to lovingly tell someone, you think your lack of hunger is because you're just going through the daily grind. No, your lack of hunger is because you're dying and you don't even know it. Your lack of hunger is a sign that something in you isn't right. And if you don't address it, it'll be too late and you'll be dead before you even know it. Come on, do you remember how he'd wake you up in the middle of the night and your heart would burn within you at the tap of the Holy Spirit on your shoulder? Don't die. Don't die. The church can't, we can't afford to invite a world to a, to a God that we're no longer hungry for. Don't die. Don't die. Get your hunger back. Lift those hands. God, restore hunger within us tonight. We stir up hunger within us, Jesus. I know it's Wednesday night, but I'm going to challenge you. It's still summertime. I'm going to challenge you to leave your seat if you're hungry, if you're willing to be hungry. Will you come spend five minutes in this altar? Come on, leave your seat. Come to the altar. Lift your hands to the Lord. You're like that little woman. You're making a move. Like Jairus, you're making a move. Come on. Hallelujah. All over this room, lift your hands to the Lord. Say, God, I, I, I want you to stir a hunger in me again. Lord, heal me. Heal me of that which has been draining me of appetite where you are concerned. Deliver us from that which has been robbing us of appetite, where the things of heaven are concerned. God, move in this house. Move in my life. Come on, seek him right now. Seek him right now. Ask him, hey, there's an awakening coming. God's looking for somebody that'll touch the hem of his garment. He's looking for somebody that'll push, somebody that'll press, somebody that'll lean in, somebody that'll say, I'm thirsty. I need more of you. Oh!
awaken our hearts to you, God. God, you're the desire of our hearts. Our hearts are crying out for you, Jesus. Oh, God, have mercy on us from where we've missed you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you are a God who answers prayers, and you're a God that hears your children. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you for stirring passion, God. I thank you for stirring fires, Father. I thank you for fires breaking out in workplaces and schools, Father. We have to see an awakening, God. We have to see an awakening. Thank you, Jesus. Change. Break chains, Father. Father, I pray tonight, God, that you would free us from the, the junk food that we keep consuming. Those false carbs, that stuff that fills us up temporarily while it works to destroy us inwardly. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us physically, but God, I pray for our souls. I pray, Lord, that, that you would touch us. I pray, God, that you would grace us. Come on, will you, will you pray right now? You see, for someone, for someone here tonight, the Lord says, you've been listening to, to them talk and preach about the church and generations. But he says, I want to talk to you personally. You're trying to fill up your life with stuff. You're trying to fill your, the, the desires, the holes in your heart. You're trying to fill it with sex outside of marriage covenant. You're trying to convince yourself that it's okay. You're trying to justify it. But in your heart, in your spirit... You have a conscience, but you keep trying to, you keep thinking that's your answer, that, that gives you relief, but the Lord said it's only temporary relief, and that's why it never satisfies, and that's why you keep finding yourself in these cycles, but if you'll turn to Jesus tonight. If you'll return to Jesus tonight, if you'll turn, if you'll turn and say, God, I've got to, I got to touch you. I don't want to keep living in this cycle. I, I don't, because listen to me, listen to me. There is a death sentence over that kind of living. The wages of sin is death. I don't care who you are. And I don't care how right it feels. The wages of sin is death. There is pleasure in sin for a season. But the end of that season is death. Get it right with God. Get real with Jesus. I can't make you God, I wish I could because he loves you and he doesn't want you to reap the whirlwind of trouble he wants you to reap the goodness of his blessing and you're just one prayer away one act of genuine surrender away the life you're looking for, longing for. So Father, I pray tonight that God, you'd break through the deception that has someone's mind, and heart, and spirit. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, there would come a, a turning. I pray for the gift of repentance to be granted tonight. Oh, God, for all of us, Lord, whatever the issue may be, God, I pray there would be a turning from sin, a turning from self, 
and a turning and a returning to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, will you pray right where you are? Right where you are. Hallelujah. Right where you are. There's the, the, the holiness of God is moving in this room. He's calling for somebody here under the sound of my voice to make it right, to make it right, to surrender, to make a decision, a quality decision. I am not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to do it God's way because his way is best, his way is best, his way is best. And the, and the choices you're making are draining you of that appetite for the good things of God. But right now, right now, right now, repent all over this room. Not just sexual sin. There's other areas God's dealing with us about, people about. Come on, respond. Respond to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. Begin to cry out to him and say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me, sanctify me. If you need to get on your knees, get on your knees. And you say, well, what somebody will think you're talking about. Who cares what somebody else thinks? Come on, Jairus didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't care. And he got his baby girl. He got his baby girl back. He got his baby girl back. He got his baby girl back. Come on, if you come to a place you stop caring about what everybody else says, everybody else thinks you can get your breakthrough, you can get your miracle, you can get your freedom, you can get your, your, your life back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I just know God's dealing with some, someone. And I'm ready to, to move forward, but it's time to get real. Stop praying the religious game. thirst in me, Jesus. Stir up. Stir up a passion in me, Lord. Say, wake me up. Only the awakened can awaken another. History belongs to the awakened. Hallelujah. So come on, seek him, seek him. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. Get real, get real, get real, get real. Hallelujah. Get real. I, I'm going to say one more thing, and we're, we're moving to a different place in the service. But I, I hear the Lord saying, there's somebody maybe watching, but maybe somebody in this room, and I've got to say this to you, and you've got to hear it. The only one you're fooling is you. And there could be nothing worse to be self-deceived. There's nothing worse than to be self-deceived. And James defines the self-deceived as those who hear the word but do not practice it. Tony Evans said it this way. You cut the steak, you put it in your mouth, and you chew it. Before you swallow it, once you've chewed all the tastiness out, you just reach over and spit it out. You tell the cook how good they did, but you never allow it to get into your system to bring nutrition and to bring change. We don't want to do God's word that way. Hear it. Take notes on it. Amen it. Tell the cook, oh, you did a good job. 
but spit it out before we get in the parking lot. Because to do that means we hear, but we don't practice and we deceive ourselves. Would you dare to just say, God, I want to be awakened. So would you dare to pray? I mean, all of us, all of us. God, if there's any place in Keith Nix's life, any place in my heart where I'm chewing the food, but I'm not swallowing it and allowing it to assimilate in my system and bring change to me, forgive me, forgive Give me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit. Come on, can somebody lift your hands with me and just say, I commit. I commit to the word. I commit to truth. Will you say out loud with me? Can you say it and mean it? Do not do it religiously, but if you're real and you mean it, will you just pray, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I do surrender tonight. I surrender to your will. I surrender to your ways. Forgive me of my selfishness, of every sin. Cleanse me, I pray, and fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. And let me live as the awakened in my generation so I can awaken others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Come on. Just if you receive, praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. So will you say with me one more time, this generation is not dead. They're just asleep. When Jesus said that, every medical doctor in the world would have pronounced that girl dead. Jesus knew, but he knew there was a greater reality. And he spoke on the level of the greater reality. Come on. That's what faith does. It declares things that be not as if they are. Hallelujah. So I just declare again, as a generation, people say they're dead, but they're just sleeping. And we're going to wake them up. I said we're going to wake them up in the name of Jesus. Come on. In the name of Jesus, we're going to wake them up. Hallelujah. You know, they brought a, they brought a dead woman, and later on the platform in, in a service in, in Bahamas, Brother Hall was preaching, 1,500 people out there. He said he didn't know what to do. Rigor mortis had already sat in. And they, they, they just laid her down, expecting him to pray. He, he, he tried to delay all he could thinking the crowd would get bored and go away. But instead, word got out on the street that this white preacher from America is about to pray for a, a corpse. The crowd swelled to 3,000 people. He couldn't delay any longer. He said, I reached down and took her by the hand. He said, I'd already looked at my wife and said, we're getting out of here quick after I prayed this prayer. He, he said, I didn't have any faith. He said, I was scared. But I took her by the hand, and he said, when I took her by the hand, I almost fainted because it was cold and clammy, rigor mortis and hard. But he said, I, I knelt down, and he said, I could not think of anything to say except these words we read tonight. Talitha Kumi, little damsel, in the old King James, little damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And, and, and to hear him tell it, he said, I wish I could tell you. I said, little damsel, I say unto thee, arise. But he said it sounded more like, little damsel, I say unto thee, arise. But when he said that, she said, God brought her to life in front of 3,000 people. Glory to God. 
And I've been there. I've been to that park. I was there with Brother Hall. I've met people who were 13, 14 years old that night. And they, they, they later became the head of the minister of religion for the whole nation of the Bahamas. Saved in that service that night because when they saw that dead woman come to life again. Hallelujah. Well, I'm closing with that because if God could do that in the natural, yeah. how many believe he's going to do that? I believe we'll see it in the natural too, but I believe it's going to happen in a generation. Hallelujah. I believe there are kids right now tonight on drugs, but they're going to wake up. I believe there are kids and almost they're thinking about suicide, but they're going to wake up. But we, the church, this generation, I call this message when two generations intersect. We have got to make sure we just turn back to Jesus and say, Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. Have you received something tonight? Man, I don't want to stop. I don't want to leave. I, there's such a sweet, sweet presence of God. And we've gone longer than we normally do on a Wednesday night. But I believe miracles are happening around here. I believe deliverance is happening. And I believe freedom is coming. And I believe, so, I just sense somebody repented as God spoke to you. Hallelujah. Strongly. I, and so walk in freedom now. Let's walk in freedom. And if you need to talk, if you need to talk to me or Pastor Margie or someone about how to walk in freedom, humble yourself and say, look, this has been going on and I've been, and, and I just need, I want you to pray for me and to help me. We'll be glad to do that. Amen.